Okay. Okay. on our campus. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the ninth in a series of noon lectures sponsored by the Associated Student Speakers Program. Directly following today's speech, uh, we will have a question and answer period, and there are two floor mics set up on either side of the room. If you line up behind the mics, we will just alternate mic to mic until about uh, five minutes to one, at which time the program will end. And so at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our mayor, Sam Yorty. Well, Mr. Chairman, members of the faculty and students, thank you very much for that warm welcome. That's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> I only wish you knew how to sing better. <laughs> well, I just uh, saw some filmed uh, shots of UCLA in our new Los Angeles City film, and I wish I had it here today. It, uh, this is the first time it's been shown. They let me uh, take a preview of it. We've had it uh, in production by Wolper Studios for something like a year and a half. And uh, in picking a campus, they picked yours to show some of the educational opportunities uh, in our community. And it, uh, it is truly a, a magnificent film. I will see that it's brought out here if you'd like sometime and, uh, and show you. Uh, as you know, uh, it will be used on uh, airplanes and steamships and, and around uh, the world in various places to advertise Los Angeles. And, uh, now, because you were kind enough to, to sing uh, around the world, uh, I might uh, use this occasion to announce that I'm going a little bit uh, around the world. <laughs> On, on, uh, <laughs> and because you've been so, because you're so kind as to say go, I have to announce I'm also coming back. <laughs> well, on, uh, on December 1st of this year, uh, Bets and I will have been married 30 years. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have had a lot of experience in politics over a long period of time, in politics, out of politics. And we're going to take a two weeks trip and just decide whether we want to go on in politics, whether I would want to run for mayor again or, or not. And, uh, but this, this time we will be guests of the uh, Federal Republic of Germany, so it won't cost the city anything. And uh, we will be going to Frankfurt and then down to Israel and uh, spend, uh, as probably most of you don't know, uh, I've studied the Middle East for a long time, wrote a series of articles in 1954 that were published uh, nationally in the newspapers and put in the congressional records by then, I think, Congressman Javits because he felt that they added something to perhaps uh, the understanding of the members of Congress to the great problems in the Middle East. So this is not a new interest of mine. And uh, we have a sister city, as a matter of fact, in Israel, a little, little town called Eilat, uh, which suddenly popped into the news in a very big way uh, at the start of the Six-Day War. And so I'll get a chance to visit our sister city again. And then we're going up to Berlin, where there will be a Los Angeles festival uh, next year. Uh, this year, this year the city of New Orleans was honored by Berlin, 
and they tell me that about a million people saw the uh, New Orleans exhibit there. And so we expect to uh, put on an exhibit there next, uh, next year ourselves, which we will sort of feature the motion picture industry here. Many of the artifacts that we have, we hope to ship over there and let people see them. Uh, we will show some of our aerospace industry and just in general, uh, let people learn something about this great city of Los Angeles where you're so privileged to go to school at UCLA. And, uh, and then uh, from there we're going over to Ireland and uh, my mother was born in Ireland, a little town called, uh, a little town called Clonmel in Tipperary County. And uh, there's a little chapel there at St. Pat's Well where she used to go and it's pretty run down. So we formed in Los Angeles an Irish-Israeli society. And, uh, and they, raised, uh, they raised some money to restore this chapel. So I have the privilege of going over there and, and seeing what we're going to do to restore that little chapel in uh, not so far away, Clown Mill in a little town of Tipperary. So uh, it is partly around the world. And actually, uh, I wish I had more time to spend seeing the world because uh, it's interesting. <laughs> You know, a lot of people who are not up to date in their thinking uh, look upon uh, look upon look upon some of the places in the world as being far off, and uh, as if we are very separated from them. But uh, communications uh, have reduced the distance, the time factors to such an extent that we're all neighbors in this whole world today, and that's one of the reasons that we don't have any choice. We have to learn to live together. And we're going to have to live together uh, in peace according to some rules and standards to which there must be some adherence. And until that is done, uh, there will be no peace. Now, I don't know of any place where uh, we need to stimulate thinking about the problems of our cities and our nation and the world any more than we do on these great campuses uh, where you uh, of the generation one gap back uh, are soon going to have to take over uh, and run the affairs of this country. And it's a lot different to have the responsibility of running a country than it is to sit on the outside and complain about all the things done by the establishment. When you get on the inside, you find out you don't have all the options uh, that you thought you had when you're on the outside. And that's one of, that's one of, uh, this is one of the reasons that a, a more naive type candidate uh, who hasn't had experience in government sometimes has an advantage uh, over those who do have experience because if you're naive enough to believe that you can take over a government and actually cut the budget and uh, cut out a lot of things to which the people are accustomed and you can say that with sincerity uh, you'll get a lot of supporters who also believe that it can be done but uh, when you get into office it isn't possible to uh, witness the largest tax increase in the history of any state in the Union recently passed in the state of California. So uh, what you really, if you're an experienced candidate, uh, you're handicapped by knowing the problems, uh, and if you're honest about it, you're not going to make promises that you can't keep. The, the budgets of our cities and uh, the other levels of government are not very apt to be cut uh, in the near future in any appreciable way. As a matter of fact, if you can cut in one place, you find such a heavy demand for the money in another place that you end up simply transferring it to that activity too. Now, it isn't as if this country uh, were poor and unable to afford the things uh, that we need to do. Uh, this country is very rich. Uh, it is, is so rich that it's almost unbelievable uh, when you go around and see other places and see uh, how poor many of them are uh, and, uh, and how much we have actually done in other countries. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is that it, it becomes a matter of how much of your resource you want to devote to any one particular problem. Uh, and if that means that it's the federal government or the state government or the city uh, charged with that responsibility, it gets right back down to that one thing, taxes. Uh, taxes are the way that you marshal resources 
for a federal program or a state program or a city program. Uh, and so if there isn't enough money, it doesn't indicate that the, the country or the city is poor. It just means that there's a lack of determination uh, as to how much of the resource you're willing to apply to a particular problem, whether it be education, the war on poverty, uh, or any other problem. We have the money to do the things that need to be done, uh, but uh, you have to tax in order to do them. Now, uh, again, at a, at a campus, uh, I hope that uh, we can keep our great universities uh, in an environment where people will be willing to listen uh, and to reason. Uh, it's just the nature of, of most people uh, to make up their minds about uh, any particular subject uh, and then close their minds to all arguments to the contrary. And uh, many times these opinions uh, start uh, with a mere emotion. Now, when I spoke at uh, the University of Illinois uh, two nights ago, uh, the, the, very, the very word, the, the <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, I spoke at the Choate and Yale and uh, Illinois all this week. But, uh, uh, but uh, at, uh, at the University of Illinois, I shared the platform with Adam Clayton Powell, whom I think spoke here. Uh, I've known him a long time. We served in Congress together. And uh, in many, many, uh, many subjects, Mr. Powell and I would be in agreement. And, of course, one of them is respect for each other because we worked together in the Congress and we were friends and we're still friends. But uh, I noticed in that audience the, the mere mention of the word police, a lot of people started hissing. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, all, of, all, of this, all of this indicates, I think, a lack of real reasoning in depth about the problem in police-community relations. And I think you have to, to analyze this problem and realize that with so many people, uh, they simply say that if any policeman is guilty of misconduct, that all policemen are bad. And then they criticize the whole police department. And yet, uh, and yet you must realize in a community like ours uh, that if somebody uh, tries to uh, mug you and take your property or hurt you, uh, you don't call the mayor, you call the police. And, uh, and, uh, and if, uh, if, if somebody tries to break into your home, and perhaps uh, if you're in the age bracket where you have a wife and family and they're going to injure them, you don't call the mayor. You call the police. And so if, if you analyze this problem, you realize that your constitutional right to be secure in your person and your property is guaranteed in the first instance by that policeman. He's the guy who comes to see that your constitutional right is respected. Now, if he doesn't come, then you'll have chaos in the community. So you've got to strive to understand uh, the problem of the policeman and the problem of enforcing the law, and it doesn't do any good just to condemn all policemen and uh, call them pigs and show disrespect. Uh, this only makes the problem more aggravated. And uh, so uh, I think that, uh, that if you turn this same sort of reasoning around, you have many whites who say, well, a Negro committed a crime, therefore all Negroes are bad. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that kind of argument can only make our problems more difficult and uh, make them more difficult to solve. So we, we are trying in our community to improve relations between the law enforcement agency uh, and the people. Uh, and believe me, it, it isn't easy, and some people don't make it any easier, uh, but we have to strive to solve it. It doesn't do any good to just start calling each other names. The only way you can solve these problems is to get down to the hard work of trying to do something about them. I think that we are making progress. At least we hope we've made a lot of progress uh, in the city of Los Angeles, and I hope the same thing will be happening across the country. Now, as you know, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, in 1964, the National Urban League uh, said that Los Angeles was the, the best big city in the United States for minority people. 
And uh, yet in 1965, we were the first of the big cities to have a serious riot. So this certainly gives you some reason to try and analyze uh, what brought this about. Because the fact that it was triggered by an arrest by the State Highway Patrol uh, means only that that was the spark. The situation had to be there. And of course, you've had for over a hundred years, you've had very serious grievances uh, by the minority people. And anyone would have to be blind uh, who didn't recognize that they existed. Uh, and sometimes when you tried to do something about it, you didn't get too much public support. Uh, a lot of you people uh, don't realize that uh, when I became mayor in 1961, I integrated the whole Los Angeles city government. Uh, your, your detractors don't like to talk about that, uh, but this was in 1961. And uh, ever since 1961, some of the major departments, uh, and certainly those most important to minority people, have been headed by minorities because we have, as you know, a commission form of government, and you have five commissioners who are the head of a department. They're, they're, they are the head of the department. The police chief is the general manager of that department, but the head of that department is a police commission and five lay commissioners. And uh, three of them have always been from minorities ever since 1961. And so uh, this was one of the things uh, that I had uh, tried to do. I did the same with the fire department. I did the same thing with civil service. I remember so well when I first got in office and uh, appointed Lewis Dodge Gill to the Board of Public Works. And uh, he sent for a secretary, uh, and uh, they sent down a, a girl who was a Negro girl who had been working as an assistant clerk or something like that. And she turned out to be a very good secretary. And uh, Mr. Gill said to her, well, how come you've been working uh, below uh, your level in the city government? And she said, well, Mr. Gill, I've been sent out 32 times, but they always send three, and I always get rejected. And so... Uh, with, well, upon finding that out, uh, I looked at some of these departments and I found that there were departments where general managers had systematically discriminated uh, against people from minorities and they had used this rule of three to do it because they could always get uh, one of the three that would be somebody that, uh, that they would hire. So we put through a new rule that uh, if the person who passed number one was a minority person, that the general manager would have to explain in writing why that applicant was rejected if sent to his department. So these are just some of the things that we have done from the very first days of my administration. Uh, and uh, because of this, you can understand my great disappointment when Los Angeles was the first scene of a riot. Now, I, I'm not one of those I'm not one of those who says that the, the riot didn't do some good. Uh, I don't, of course, I'm not advocating rioting, but that rioting did wake a lot of people up. And uh, I had had, for instance, uh, before the city council, uh, a project called the Community Analysis Project. Uh, and I couldn't get it through the council. It was, and it wasn't our own money. We were just simply making an application for a federal grant. Uh, to do something that, that seems uh, elementary when you talk about it, that's to really make an inventory of all the people and the resources of your city, uh, the conditions in all areas, and really come to grips with the problem on the basis of a definitive analysis that tells you exactly what you've got, how many unemployed, who they are, uh, what skills they have or what skills they don't have, uh, where property is deteriorating before you get to the point where you have to have urban renewal, uh, to do something about it, and it was simply a real analysis of our whole city. Well, the Los Angeles Times opposed me on that, and I couldn't get it through the city council. But, uh, but after the rioting, after the rioting, the Los Angeles Times changed its mind and decided I was right, and so did the council, and that analysis is now in the process of taking place. Uh, and when we get that, it would be very helpful. Now, of course, you run into a other, lot of other problems that the public doesn't always get a full understanding. Uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, well, you know, speaking of the garbage, uh, uh, I can tell you that the, the men in our sanitation department uh, who do a lot of, who do a lot of hard work and believe me, uh, I have nothing but sympathy for him. It's a dirty, hard job. Well, uh, 
they, they wouldn't find you amusing because this week, uh, or about two weeks, they will all go on the five-day week, which means they'll work Monday through Friday like everybody else, instead of having to go through uh, Saturday and take their day off uh, in one during the week and one on Sunday. And finally, uh, we are going to put everybody uh, on the five-day week, and they are very happy about it. Most of the city has been put on the five-day week progressively, but uh, now they will all go on the five-day week. <laughs> um, um, you know, uh, I'll tell you, you know, a, a, fi a five day week would really be nice. I would like to have it because everybody wants to everybody uh, everybody wants to raise a flag on Saturday. So uh, one of these days I'm going to compile all the flags I've raised down City Hall on Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. Now let me just say this one more thing to you. Uh, I do not believe in being a hide bound partisan to any party uh, or any particular group because when you do that they do your thinking for you uh, and I think that uh, the idea uh, I think that the idea of the, the younger generation being a little more independent uh, in their voting habits and in their assessment of the candidates uh, is something that will really help our country in its governing process uh, I don't think that uh, you should allow anyone uh, to go to a convention and uh, pick a candidate and then feel that you've closed your mind and you're absolutely compelled to vote for him because you're a registered Democrat or Republican uh, or whatever. Uh, I think that, uh, that it's kind of silly to argue uh, that if you have a Democrat who has uh, no ability and he's up against a Republican with a lot of ability that, uh, that you should still vote for the Democrat and vice versa. Uh, I like to think that, uh, that you're able to reason for yourselves uh, to think for yourselves and to vote for candidates on the basis of what you think their merits are and what the issues are uh, and to analyze those issues and not just close your minds and be carried away by the groups that happen to be the loudest but perhaps far from the most shrewd when it comes to thinking uh, and the most of the people on campuses as in the city uh, are not activists they don't take as much part as they should in public affairs but they are the great majority, uh, and uh, I feel myself that on these great campuses, in spite of the antics of some who would make good clowns, that most of the students are very fine, well-intentioned future citizens. Thank you. Do uh, you want me to explain about the schedule? We're now going to have a question and answer period. If you'll line up with these two mics on the side, the mayor, will, the mayor will answer your questions. Right. Fine. And because of scheduling, we're going to have to uh, cut it off about five minutes to one. Thank you. Why don't we start with this side, right over here? Uh, Mr. Mayor, last, last June, after the assassination of Senator Kennedy, you read, <coughs> you read from the diary of Sirhan Sirhan, and you claimed at that time when there was a lot of controversy about your actions that the people had a right to know <laughs> about this evidence. In uh, the recent, recent investigations against the city government, you claimed that a number of public officials were, were lynched by, or publicly lynched by information that was given out by either the, the prosecutor or the newspapers. And I, I wonder if you... Th feel that these two positions are inconsistent. Well, uh, you stated them incorrectly. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sorry what you've stated is incorrect, but uh, I will answer it. Uh, in, the Sirhan, in the Sirhan case, uh, when, uh, when Senator Kennedy was first assassinated uh, and we had a suspect, when we had the, at the, the very early hours, we captured the suspect, but he wouldn't tell us who he was. And uh, we had a, a rumor that uh, got so far as to be on a national wire service uh, that uh, Mr. Kennedy had been assassinated by a light-skinned Negro. Then we had another one that it was, he looked like a Mexican-American. Uh, another one that he looked like a Jamaican. And so all of these wild rumors were going around, uh, and we certainly didn't want this sort of thing to happen. 
uh, that happened uh, after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. So we wanted to spike these rumors as fast as we could. And that's why we identified uh, Sirhan Sirhan and uh, tried to tell enough about him so that uh, people could see uh, who he was and relate that uh, to the deed that uh, he had committed. Mr. Secretary, uh, Mayor. Uh, Thank you. How are the Los Angeles City Commissioners appointed or elected or chosen, and how do you account for all the troubles we've been having with them as of late? Well, they're appointed uh, by the mayor on recommendation of other people or some of them by councilmen. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, and before anyone is appointed, I can tell you that uh, we run a, a very careful check on them through all the law enforcement records. So uh, anybody who is appointed has an absolutely clear record. Uh, and uh, then they, they must, of course, they must, of course, be confirmed by the city council. I don't say that uh, because a person may have some past blemish that it's fair to eliminate them, but, but we do this to, uh, to uh, keep them from being embarrassed by some councilman, for instance, uh, who might want to make them a target of attack because of something they've done in the distant past uh, for which they have either uh, paid the penalty, some youthful thing, like I had a commissioner one time, uh, who, when we looked up his record, uh, it's had a petty theft on it. And so uh, I said, well, uh, I said, it's too bad this is a serious subject and I don't have much time and I don't mind all that, but I'd, I'd like to be able to talk to the students who want to hear this and ask the question. This, this man had this petty theft. And so I called him in and, uh, and I said, you know, if when you go before the council, I, send, I have to send these records there, and uh, they may hold you up to, to ridicule on this. And he said, well, uh, Sam, he said, that was a matter at Utah University when I was on campus, and he said, uh, as a prank, we siphoned some gasoline out of a fellow's tank, and, uh, and he said, we were arrested for it, but uh, we, we were never convicted, it was dropped, but he said, it is true. So uh, I, I said to him, well, you know, you have to make your own decision about whether you want to have this perhaps brought up. And he said, well, uh, <laughs> I might as well face it. As it was, uh, nobody was mean enough to refer to this. But, uh, but on the other hand, there, if we believe that you can be rehabilitated when you've committed some crime, then, uh, then why, why do we put, why do we always hold even an arrest record against people? Uh, I've ordered our Civil Service Commission to stop doing it. Because, uh, after all, uh, we've, we've, found, we've found that a lot of the hardcore unemployed were people who had some kind of a criminal record. And they had gone to place after place trying to get a job. They had filled out the form, and when they'd come to that little line, have you ever been convicted of a felony, ever been convicted of a misdemeanor? And they had to put yes in there. They would get a very polite statement from the personnel director that if we have an opening, we'll call you, and they never heard any more. And so when the little Watts manufacturing plant uh, was opened by Aerojet General, one of the rules they made that, that uh, criminal records would not be held against the people uh, seeking employment. And they told me, of course, they had 5,000 applicants for uh, about 200 jobs, which sort of gives the lie to those who say these people won't work. But the first thing that many of those applicants would ask is, will a criminal record uh, deprive you uh, of the chance to have employment here? And they, they didn't even want to fill out any more forms till they found that out. And having found that out, they would fill out the forms, and they told me down there that some of the best employees they have are some with the worst criminal records because they <coughs> seem so anxious to show uh, that they will make good if given the opportunity. So getting back to this, we do look at all the records, and the council has confirmed the councilman. I have a, uh, I mean, the council confirms the commissioners. I've appointed hundreds of them, of course, and uh, uh, few have caused trouble, but the two that are convicted, uh, and of course, uh, not finally, they're appealing their cases, but uh, they were not commissioners at the time they were accused for reasons uh, that wouldn't be fair to state now. I had already removed them. In the case of Mr. Watson, 
Uh, I do say that he was <coughs> legally lynched. Uh, I, I related some of the instructions that the judge here gave to a very learned judge yesterday, and uh, he was pretty shocked because this judge instructed that jury uh, that Mr. Watson didn't have to intend any wrong, uh, he did not have to be corrupt, he didn't have to know he was doing anything wrong, he didn't have to gain by it, uh, the city didn't have to lose by it, but that if he voted on this contract for the Princess Louise with a member of the corporation uh, owing him money, a good friend of his who borrowed money and paid it back, but in all of given all these things, he was to be declared guilty of a felony, and I think he practically instructed that jury uh, to find him guilty. I think the instructions were very unfair. They were based upon another case, a Darby case that I looked up myself where the facts were entirely different, completely different situation. And I firmly believe that if this judge doesn't grant a new trial, that some appellate court will reverse that conviction. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, over here. Uh, Mr. Yardy, uh, yesterday you stated that you're thinking of suing the Times for a cartoon that appeared that practically stated that you are insane. Now, even yeah. now, now, even if this is not tr even if this is not true, um, <laughs> what legal base do you have to stand on to sue them, or is it just that in these tense days before an election with a lot of uh, potential candidates that you can use an, a, a good scapegoat? Well, that's. Uh Thank you for the nice question, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, there, there really is no protection anymore uh, for a public official in the matter of libel. And this doesn't apply just to a public official now. The courts have extended it to a public figure. So uh, you can say almost anything you want to, even, even deliberately lie uh, about a so-called public figure, uh, and he or she has no protection. Uh, this might sound funny to some of you, but you may be public figures someday, and then you'll realize I'm talking about. But uh, the courts have held that you must prove actual malice. And, of course, actual malice is a state of mind very difficult to prove. So from the standpoint of a practical purpose, uh, you have really been stripped of any protection against people who deliberately uh, lie uh, and, uh, and who, who know they're lying. But in, in the case of this cartoon, uh, we're checking on the law because even with these stringent rules uh, and the tremendous burden of proof on a person uh, complaining against a newspaper, I'm not so sure about what they may have gone a little bit too far. Whether I'd bother, be interested uh, in suing them or not is another decision that will have to be made. But first, we are taking a look at it uh, because, not for my sake, I'm used to being uh, libeled by the Times, and uh, <laughs> but... Uh, it's just for the sake of, of establishing uh, what the law is, helping to, how far you can go uh, in uh, doing the sort of thing that they do. Okay, so we go to this side. Mr. Yordi, uh, you were elected uh, mayor of Los Angeles, not secretary of state or secretary of defense. And I know <laughs> some of us citizens are getting tired of you spending half your time criticizing the president, criticizing the administration, when if you put 100% effort to solve all, some of our problems, and stop giving us lip service, maybe we would solve a few more than are question? being solved. A, a very good question. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think that I have to defend myself to you for my administration in the city. But I will say to you, I will, I will say to you that past mayors have usually been able to take a, a month off all at one time and take a vacation. And uh, in, seven, in seven years, uh, I have had one week twice that was really a vacation. Now, if you get the idea that, uh, if you get the idea that like going over to Japan where I've been before I was mayor, so I don't need to go there to see it, uh, going over there on a trade mission, going over there on a trade mission where they give you a schedule and you get up early in the morning much like carrying on a political campaign and you travel all day and make speeches and meet with people and stand in reception lines. If you think that's a vacation, I just, w I just wish I could sentence you to one of the trips. 
Mr. Yordi, I wasn't referring to your trips. I was referring to your press conferences and your programs where you uh, spend a lot of time on, uh, well, well, on foreign policy. I, you, I'm, that's what I was referring to. Are you to. suggesting that I not be available to the press? I'm suggesting that you should confine yourself to the problems of the city of Los Angeles. Well, do you, do you, uh, <laughs> I don't think that's what you, I think I don't think that's what you really mean because uh, 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 there are many mayors of big cities who speak out on problem there are many mayors of big cities who speak out on problems uh, that are not particularly their city problems but I think if you agreed with what they said then you'd think that uh, they probably should speak out but since you don't agree with what I say you'd like to shut me up but you can't Okay. <laughs> With regards to uh, police community relations, I, I don't want to debate whether the police are guilty of malpractice in general. I, I I say with regard to police community relations, I don't want to debate whether the police are ever guilty of malpractice in any particular case, but the fact is that a lot of ghetto residents think they are. Don't you think that it would be a good psychological step to open the uh, police uh, hearings into malpractice cases <laughs> have them open to the public so that if there is no malpractice, the people can be convinced that there isn't. And if there is, then the public can see the, the just very few individuals that do cause these problems. Well, you may have a, a very valid point because we're striving for ways to set up procedures that uh, will convince the public that where we find that an officer is guilty of misconduct, the department itself wants to punish him, and oftentimes we just simply fire them. Uh, but uh, as, you, as I say again, we do have a civilian police commission, and they have complete authority over that department. Uh, if they want to bring a matter out for hearing, uh, they can delve into it, they could make it public, and uh, there the officer will be faced with three minority people out of five. Of okay, i go back here. Mr. Mayor, earlier you spoke about police community relations and indicated that if someone found people breaking down his door, he should call the police and not the mayor. What, what advice would you give to someone if he found that the police were breaking down his door? Well, <laughs> yeah. Anybody have a question? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, could you address yourself to the question, please? Well, that isn't any question. I mean, if, if they... I have a question, Mr. That's mayor. An interesting observation, but that's about all you can put on it. Uh, about a month ago, a black motorist was shot and killed, uh, a Mr. Bodie, by a policeman who said he uh, was trying to escape. The police content was that his car was about to run over the foot of a policeman. Three policemen opened up fire, 14 shots, they killed him. This has happened before. Uh, yesterday, the, the uh, commission ju judging the case returned a verdict of six to one justifiable mm -hmm. homicide to one of criminal homicide. Now, in light of the question that the fellow in front of me asked, you said that there's a commission that appoints, that, that has members that look into cases, but it is the police commission itself that is investigating charges of police brutality and police malpractice. Now, in light of, a ca of cases like this, of the Deadweiler case, of what happened at Century City last June, do you think the idea of a civilian control board made up of civilians from the general community would be a good idea for L.A.? Well, we have, uh, I think we have more than that in Los Angeles. We don't have just a review board. We have a commission that actually heads the department. But, but that's appointed by the police. there are people on there. But it's the police who begin the initial investigation. It's like a military well, court martial. The commission is composed of, of civilians. They are not uh, paid by us. They get $10 a meeting to pay for the lunch and the parking. They are citizens <laughs> devoting their time. And, and believe me, they deserve... A lot of credit for the time they put in for nothing in the affairs of the city of Los Angeles. Okay. Oh, lots of policemen are found guilty when they commit uh, the acts, and a lot of them are fired, reprimanded. You don't see the report, but it's public. You know, we've sent the reports of, uh, of the actions that we take in police misconduct cases. We have sent them to the newspapers, and we still can't get them published. So the public has no idea of the disciplinary procedures that we are employing all of the time. Okay. I'd like to ask what you think of the discriminatory laws on the Sunset Strip. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's in the county and not in the city. 
Well, you push. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh -huh. You could make comments on world affairs. The county's all right. What do you say? I don't know. By the way, there's a similar law in Los Angeles that's being pushed through the city council. Now, do you actually believe there's this is constitutional, you know? Well, uh, you'll have to wait till it gets to the United States Supreme Court. I don't know whether it's constitutional or not. <laughs> we think it is or we wouldn't enact it. The city attorney uh, usually tells us whether he thinks a particular law is constitutional or not. Why did you enact the law? Why are they enacting laws? The council enacted it because they hoped to meet a condition that was causing a lot of trouble in a particular area. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, what there's a uh, popular radio show out known as Just Plain Sound. It's on I one of the radio stations. I'd like to get your opinion on this particular show. Uh, I'm very sorry, I couldn't hear your question. There's a popular radio show which uh, uh, perhaps uh, is not too accurately representing your character, or perhaps so. It's known as Just Plain Sam. I wonder if you've heard it. Just Plain Sam? Sam. <laughs> I can you hear what he said? Oh, Sam. Oh, I thought you said sound. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I've never heard it, so I can't comment on it. It's on KRLA, 1110. Well, I've never, I've never heard the... I've never heard the radio show, so I, I can't comment. Did you support the mass cleanup arrests in Venice? Clean up what? The mass cleanup Venice arrests. Well, that I'll Last tell you, year. we certainly uh, will be working on the situation in Venice from every angle. Exactly now, what is the uh, situation in Venice? Well, of course, I can't hear what he's saying, so. Uh, what is the Venice situation has, in Venice? It Venice seems like people a, are being uh, harassed. They're being denied those rights that you said the police are supposed to keep for us. Well, Venice has been a deteriorating area that we certainly hope to change and improve. And one of the things that we initiated a long time ago that I think that uh, someday will be more important than some of the passing problems is the uh, restoration of these canals. We're going to make them very beautiful with an outlet to the sea. And, uh, you know, we, we, sit here and, we sit here and talk about a lot of current problems, but you forget that uh, the great cities are known by the things they build and not what they don't build. And, uh, and we, are doing, we are doing a tremendous amount of building in this community. And one of the projects uh, is the Venice Canals, and I think that this will hope to help the whole area. I think people down there, when they see beautiful canals instead of dirty ditches, uh, will feel better about their community and pride in their community, and we want to help them do that. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Monitor says one more. Yes, Mayor York. Let me say this to you first, though, about this generation gap. You know, <laughs> you know, it, in many ways is greatly exaggerated. But, uh, uh, when my when my son was born, uh, there, there was a tremendous gap. I was I I had had I had had 37 years more experience than he had, and he had no education, and so there was a tremendous gap. Uh, but as, as time went on, he began to get some education, and uh, so he uh, he he began to. You know, I guess one reason this doesn't annoy me is because I have a son about that age, and uh, I, I know how some of these people connect. But anyway, I, I don't—I don't mean the, I, I don't mean the, that age in his behavior. Uh, I mean that age chronologically. But at any rate, uh, at any rate, I—well, frankly, I—I uh, I came here. Uh, but as time goes on, this gap closes. And if your father was, say, 25 when you were born, he had 25 years more experience, and again, you had no education, and he had probably completed his, or nearly so. As time goes on, you get more education. But when he's 50, then the gap is closed to the extent he's only had twice as much experience as you have, instead of 25 times as much. And, and a little bit later, a little bit later, the gap closes more. But sometimes, of course, it's not a matter of age, it's a matter of maturity. And uh, where there is no real generation gap, 
where the younger people are mature, uh, who are serious about the problems of the country, and instead of wanting to make a joke of a serious discussion, uh, they want to listen and to try and understand some of the problems. Thank you. Mayor Yorty. See you later. Mr. Yorty. Now you said one more question.